And uh, will you turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11? As you're turning, I want to remind you um, next week will be the Sunday before Christmas. And for Sunday school, in our Sunday school hour, we are having a combined Sunday school class with all the adult Sunday school classes. And we'll be meeting in here in the sanctuary. So I want to invite you to come and uh, be a part of that. And I'll be teaching. And so we'll be uh, going through the lesson together as one big class. We always enjoy that when we get to do it. And we do it every now and then on special occasions. So I hope that you will come and uh, be a part of that class. And <clears throat> I may have to break a little bit. I've been <clears throat> struggling with some of the stuff we've all been struggling with this week. And uh, I'm just happy to have my voice today because <laughs> I didn't really have one Friday. Uh, but I may have to stop and breathe and take a sip. So... I will try to time them at moments where you are pondering and where it's a dramatic time to think about what I've just said. So, um, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. Uh, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, uh, in the book of Matthew, and I know I, I say that about a lot of passages I preach. You know, my favorite book of the Bible is the one that I'm studying right now. It's always true. But I genuinely do love this passage. Uh, it's, it's, one of the, it's a very familiar passage. It's one that contains a gracious invitation to us. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus has been speaking about the unbelief um, that he has been met with. As we looked at Jesus' ministry throughout the book of Matthew so far, he has, uh, he has preached, he has worked wonders, he has healed the lame, he has opened blind eyes. And crowds have followed him. The crowds have been enamored with Jesus. But he begins to teach them. And Jesus' teaching is what separates the believers from the unbelievers. And what we find out when we get to chapter 10 is Jesus sends his disciples out. He tells them that they're going to be rejected by many people. When you get to chapter 11, the whole chapter is sort of pessimistic. You start off with John the Baptist sending messengers to Jesus. Now, John the Baptist was Jesus' forerunner. And John the Baptist even sends message to Jesus by his messengers and asks him, Are you really the one? Are you really the Messiah? Or, or should we look for someone else? So John in prison is having this time of doubt. And then you go on down and Jesus says that the generation before him of people have largely rejected him and rejected John the Baptist just out of hand. And then you get to the passage that we just looked at last week where Jesus begins to speak about the cities where most of his ministry had been done. And on the whole, the people that heard him and saw his miracles did not respond to his teaching and they did not repent and believe the gospel. And even go so far as to say it would be better on the day of judgment for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it would be for these cities who have rejected Jesus. Chapter 11 is very pessimistic because we find out that Jesus, the Son of God, the one who was sent, laid in a manger and he grew up and became a man. We find out that he truly was a man despised and rejected. He truly was a man who, while his select few, his disciples, and those around them would believe on him. Many, many others rejected him. It's, as you're reading the Gospel of Matthew, it's sort of as a low point. <laughs> but then Jesus responds. And I love this passage. And I want you to read with me Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. And you read Jesus' response to this great rejection and unbelief. At that time, Jesus declared... I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now you see in this passage, this is one of those passages that combines two great truths. Charles Spurgeon was once asked, how do you reconcile the sovereignty of God and the will of man and the responsibility of man? He says, I never reconcile two friends. He says, the scripture teaches us that God is sovereign, but the scripture teaches us that we are responsible. In this passage, you have Jesus doing two things. Number one, he's accounting for the fact that people have believed and some have rejected to the Father's own sovereign, gracious will. And secondarily, he is throwing the doors wide open with a gracious invitation for those who will come. And I want to look at this and just ask you a question. I want to tell you something. Number one, Jesus is calling you, and I want to ask you a question. Will you come? Have you come, and will you come? So I want to look at this passage, and the first thing I want you to know is that no one, no one can receive the truth without divine revelation. Now Jesus says he's responding the cities have largely rejected him. People have dismissed Jesus out of hand. They've loved his miracles, but they haven't loved his teaching. And they've rejected him. And Jesus prays a strange prayer to our ears. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. Seems like a strange thing to be thankful for. But that's not all. And revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Now notice this. Jesus acknowledges the Father as the Lord of heaven and earth. Now that's important. Because we need to understand that God is sovereign in heaven and in earth. God is not out of control and this universe is not spiraling outside of His sovereignty. You've heard me say it before, that there's not one molecule in the universe that operates outside the power and the sovereignty of God. And so within this context of people believing and not believing, and Jesus being rejected, the Son turns His attention to heaven and toward the Father. And He says, Father, Your perfect and gracious will is working itself out. And I thank You that it is. And he says, you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. And you've revealed them to little children. You've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, but you've revealed them to little children. Jesus is not wringing his hands and saying, Father, this hasn't gone as we expected. He's not wringing his hands and saying, what are we going to do to increase my PR? What are we going to do to get more followers We've got to hire a, 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 a PR firm. We've, we've got to get more likes on Facebook. What are we going to do to increase our customer base? Father, we've only got a few followers. We've got to pump these numbers up. You don't read that. You don't read desperation. You don't read confusion you don't read that the father is out of control the son looks to the father and says your gracious will is being enacted because you're lord of heaven and earth now jesus says you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and you've revealed them to little children now there's a couple things going on in this passage number one we're learning that spiritual truth is not apprehended by human means. God has hidden His truth from the wise and the understanding. Now folks, you might read that and think that sounds harsh, that sounds difficult, but we're not going to mitigate the Word of God. What we learn from that is this. <clears throat> Those who attempt to know God by their human understanding will never know Him. Those who attempt to apprehend God by their own ingenuity and intuition will never find Him. He will be hidden from them. Because God is not known by human intelligence and human wisdom. Or else, all of the academics would be Christian. All of our Ivy League schools would be Christian. And that is not the case today. They began 
on a Christian foundation. Many of them began as Christian seminaries. But when we look at those who are considered by the world to be wise and understanding, you don't see a large amount of Christians represented. You do see them. But Jesus didn't come to save PhDs or engineers or doctors or academics. You see, if God was known to the wise and the understanding, then a lot of us would be just totally shut out, wouldn't we? You see, Jesus did not come to save the privileged. He didn't come to save the wise. He didn't come to save the good. You did not get saved, if you're a Christian, you did not become saved because you were smarter than the person sitting next to you who did not. You didn't get saved because you had more uh, knowledge than the person sitting next to you. You didn't get saved because you were more privileged. You didn't get saved because you were better. You might say, well, I got saved because I was raised in church and I was a good kid and I learned my Bible lesson and uh, you know, I didn't lie. And then this person sitting next to me, though, they were always a, a bad kid and they didn't mind their parents and I was just more inclined because of my goodness to get saved. And let me tell you something, folks. Deep down, I'm afraid that a lot of Christians really think that way. I think that there are a lot of Christians that think salvation is for the good or those who are just slightly damaged by sin, and those who are really in sin can't get saved. That's not the scriptural model at all. Whether wise or foolish, whether good or bad according to human standards, whether privileged or unprivileged, God saves the whosoever. And He opens the eyes of little children. What we learn from this is that God cannot be apprehended by human wisdom. He can only be apprehended by divine revelation. None of these people who received Jesus, none of these people who Jesus is describing, these little children, none of these people figured it out. None of these people ascertained it. But how did they come to know Jesus and know the truth? Because the Father revealed it to them. If you will know Jesus Christ, you will know because the Father has revealed Jesus Christ to you. And Jesus says that full, with full-throatedly, without any mitigation. If you're going to know God, you're going to know Him by divine revelation, not human intuition. Now when He says little children, He doesn't mean just little children, like only kids can get saved. Little children is Jesus' term of endearment for those who believe on Him. If you're 80 years old and you trust Christ, you're a little child in Christ. You're a little children. But there's a couple of things going on here. Jesus, number one, is acknowledging that God's Word has not failed because those who He has revealed Jesus to have believed. Isaiah 55, 11 tells us, God says, So shall my Word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Paul says that there's a great number of Jews in his day that, who did not believe. They were Jewish. The Jewish Messiah belonged to them, but they rejected him. He said, did the word of God fail? He said, of course it didn't. We never look at those who reject the gospel and say, well, the word of God just didn't do the job. God's word went out empty. No, the Bible tells us that when God's word goes out, it accomplishes exactly what God intends for it to accomplish. And Jesus says, Father, I thank you because you've hidden this from those who are trying to figure it out on their own. And you've revealed it to those who are little, who are humble, to those who you will. There's almost a little bit of sarcasm here. Jesus is talking about the wise and the understanding. They just can't get it. Perhaps he means here the Pharisees, those who were learned in the law. Perhaps he means the scribes who he has talked about at length and he is condemned. Perhaps he's talking about those who were uh, the, the well-known and the privileged ones, the, uh, the interpreters of the law. You see, Jesus' disciples who believed on him were not great theologians. They were not priests or scribes. They were fishermen, tax collectors, and the like. They were common men. You see, God has done something in His sovereignty that only God can do. He opens the eyes of the ignorant and the unlearned and shows them Jesus. 
And God has chosen the weak and the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. When we stand before God and the believers stand before the judgment seat, not a one of us will be able to say, I was just smart enough, I was lucky, I figured it out. No one will do that. But the greatest to the least will say, I believed in Jesus because my eyes were open to see Him. Matthew 18.3, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus has done this sort of juxtaposition of the believing and the unbelieving before. So you have here the wise and understanding contrasted with little children. Which is amazing because we, you know, we're the opposite. You know, we think, uh, sometimes as parents, parents think that, you know, kids just can't understand certain things. Par- kids can understand a lot of things. But we think about, well, these lofty truths, they belong to, they belong to the, uh, the adults. When we'll really teach the adults. Let me tell you something. We have Kingdom Kid Ministry just because we want to teach the kids in an appropriate method. Let me tell you, Pastor Rick and Marcy back there teaching those kids. They're not teaching those kids dumbed down, silly things because Jesus reveals his truth don't ever think that big church as we might call it is for the adults and then we have these little piddly things we tell kids because the gospel is simple the gospel is simple and Jesus reveals his truth to the young and to the old to the wise and to the foolish without respect of persons Parents, don't ever think that your children can't understand the things of God. Your responsibility is to teach them those things and to help them to learn. They can understand. They can. But we see the wise and understanding contrasted with little children who we don't normally think of as apprehending these great truths. And then we also see, remember in Matthew 9, when Jesus contrasted the believers and the unbelievers, or those who rejected and those who didn't reject Him, as the righteous and unrighteous. Jesus says, I didn't come down here to save righteous people. We could read this verse also this way. I thank you, Father, that you've hidden these things from the righteous people and revealed them to the unrighteous people. Then he said it another way. He said, I didn't come for those who were well. I'm a physician. I didn't come for those who are already well. I came for the sick. Jesus could have said it this way. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have hidden these things from those who are well and you've revealed them to those who are sick. Jesus uses similar language when he speaks of the first and the last. He said, many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. In other words, many who are wise and understanding, they're not going to know it. And many who are little children, are they going to understand it? There's this principle of reversal. God's truth is not known by human power, human goodness, human privilege, or human understanding. It is known by... Because God in, takes the initiative and reveals it. Matthew 16. <clears throat> as God, Matthew's gospel rocks on and people have different responses to Jesus and the disciples continue to follow him. In Matthew 16, we have a climax. When Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Who do men say that I am? And they say, Well, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah or one of the prophets. And he just points it and he says, But now who do you say that I am? Now that's the question every one of us needs to answer. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Home run, Peter. You nailed it. Oh, Peter, you're so smart. You did so well in your Bible lessons, Peter, that you were able to figure out that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Oh, Peter, what a smart little student you are. That is not what Jesus said. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If you know Jesus today, you can thank the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for introducing you. Matthew 13, 10 through 17. Well, I'm 10 through 11. I'm not going to read the whole section. But you can read the whole section, and Jesus speaks in similar terms. The disciples came to him saying, Why do you speak to them in parables? In Matthew 13, Jesus makes a huge shift. He just starts talking in parables. And the disciples ask, Why are you doing this? 
And he answered to them, he says, Because to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Jesus' response to rejection by others is to ground it in the revelation of the Father to those who believe. And he says, oh, Father, this is your gracious will. He says, all of this, Father, is according to your plan, according to your grace. 2 Timothy 1.9 tells us that God saved us. And he called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So we need to understand that if we come to Christ, it is because through the Holy Spirit, God has drawn us to Christ. And you didn't get there under your own strength. You were dead in your sins. You were blind. You couldn't see Jesus. You were blind. You couldn't hear the gospel. You were deaf. You couldn't get up and walk. You were dead and lame. All these things apply to us. When Paul says we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we take that to mean we were badly wounded. That's not what he says. He says we were dead. And unless you're made alive, you can't come. We're blind. And unless you're given sight, you can't see. So Jesus says no one can know these things unless God reveals them. But he also says, <coughs> takes it a little further. No one can know the Father and the Son without divine revelation. To know spiritual truth, true spiritual truth, is to know the Father and the Son. If someone thinks they know something spiritual, or they have some spiritual nugget to share, or that they're religious, but they don't confess Jesus Christ as the, as the Son of God, then they don't know anything. No one can know the Father and the Son without divine revelation. And no one belongs to the Father or knows the Father who doesn't believe in the Son. No one belongs to the Son or knows the Son that doesn't believe in the Father. Notice what Jesus says. Now, how did Jesus describe the Father a moment ago? He said He was Lord of heaven and earth, didn't He? But now look here in verse 27. He says, Oh, and all things have been handed over to me by my Father. My Father is the Lord over heaven and earth, but He's given that same authority to me. Same thing Jesus says in the Great Commission. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Jesus is not a good man. He is not a good teacher. He is not a prophet only. Jesus is God incarnate, sharing the same privileges and prerogatives as the Father. Because in verse 25, who's doing the revealing? The Father's doing the revealing. But in verse 27, who's doing the revealing? The Son is doing the revealing. In verse 25, who has authority in heaven and earth? Well, the Father has it. In verse 27, who has authority in heaven and earth? The Son has it. There's no distinction. There's no separation of power or authority. The Father has given all things to the Son. And Jesus says, no one knows the Son. Now catch this. This really reads like a line out of the Gospel of John. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Now let's think about this Son-Father relationship. Jesus says, no one knows the Father. So we're talking about God the Father. And Jesus says, you know what? None of you all even know God. The Father. He says, I do. The Son knows the Father. But you know what? No one even really knows the Son except the Father. What he's saying here is we have a mutual relationship as Father and Son. And no other being on earth shares in that. In other words, the Holy Spirit is not explicitly mentioned here, but we know as we go on the Holy Spirit is there. Within the Trinity, within the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they have perfect communion and fellowship. To know here doesn't mean to just like know, you know. Uh, I, I know President Trump, I know of him, I have an awareness of him. It's, it's, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about knowing about someone. Uh, you know, we're not talking about knowing our, our favorite athlete or, or uh, you know, favorite musician. We're talking about having an intimate relationship, a, a knowing. You might know me, you might know my wife, but we know each other, and that's different. You know, you might know my mom and dad, but they're my mom and dad, and no one knows them the way that I know them. 
And Jesus says, no one knows the Son but the Father, no one knows the Father but the Son. In other words, there is an exclusive relationship between the Father and the Son, and nobody gets into that except one way. What we're, what we're looking at here, folks, is this. People sometimes say, well, in eternity past, God was so lonely in heaven, and God needed companionship, so that's why He created us. You need to delete that. Throw that in the trash. That's total garbage. God needs nothing. Jesus said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. You may not comprehend this, but God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have perfect relationship, perfect family, perfect unity and communion, and outside of them, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God needed nothing. Not even your companionship and mine. Because we believe that God is sufficient in and of Himself. You see, we're not. God is independent. You're not independent. You're dependent. You're dependent on God. You're dependent on uh, the air God made. You're dependent on food. You're dependent when you're a baby on your parents. God depends and needs nothing. God is the self-sufficient one. And if you were to divide everything that exists into two columns, you would have created and uncreated. Do you know what would go in the created column? Worms, bacteria. Um, Okay, let's move on up. Cats and dogs, squirrels, elephants, giraffes, tigers, lions, bears. What was that? (laughs) Then you move on up, and then you get us, human beings. But we're not done yet. You can move on up the ladder. Angels, seraphs, cherubs, archangels, the highest of the angels, Satan himself, all go in the created column. The universe, the worlds, the stars, black holes, our sun, planets, the entire universe goes in the created column. What goes in the uncreated column? God, what else? Well, it's a trick question. Well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yes. My point is God. And Jesus says, in that column, no one else belongs there but me and the Father. And we also understand the Holy Spirit. So what I want you to understand is that there is this exclusive relationship between the Father and the Son, and you're not part of it. And I'm not part of it. But, Jesus says, No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. This is why in 1 John 1.3, John says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, when you know Jesus and you know the Father, it is because you have been invited into a divine communion. You don't just come in and go out. You didn't come in under your own power, and you don't go out under your own power. You don't go out at all. You are brought in, set in, made a child of God, made a partaker of the divine nature, and you are invited into the eternal fellowship of God. When you are saved, you are made a son and a daughter of God. Although you are a sinner, a rebel, and an enemy of God, Jesus died on the cross taking your sin. He imputes to you His perfect righteousness and allows you to come into the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're not a part of that by nature. Because no one knows the Father except the Son. But you are invited into it by grace. If you know Jesus, you know Him by grace. If you know the Father, you know Him by grace. And that means you know Him by revelation. Because He is not known any other way. Because He is completely other than. Let me give you one more thing. Have you ever heard an analogy for the Trinity? You ever heard an analogy like to describe the three persons in one? It was heresy. 
You might say, oh, pastor, no, this is one's good. Nope, it's heresy. It's not right. They get sort of close. They kind of give us a handle, I understand, but they're heresy. Do you know why that is? Because God can't be compared with any created thing. You might say, well, the Trinity is like uh, water, ice, and steam. You know, it's the same substance, but three different phases of matter. Here's the problem, though. You can't have water, ice, and steam at the same time, can you? No, you can't. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have existed eternally. They are co-equal. They are co-eternal. You might say, well, the Father and the Holy Spirit, it's like one egg, but you have the white, the yolk, and the shell. But here's the thing. There's a problem with that. The white is not the shell, and the shell is not the yolk. They're different things. They are parts of one thing. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not three parts of a pie. They are co-equal, co-eternal. You see, you might say, well, it's like you, Pastor Ray. You're a pastor, but you're also a husband, and you're also a son. But here's the thing. Those are just roles. Those aren't persons. I don't talk to myself, Ray the pastor, uh, how are you doing today? I'm Ray the son. That would be ridiculous. But the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct, sharing relationship. The problem here is this, is that every analogy for the Trinity is absolute heresy because the Trinity, God, is totally unlike anything we know or can devise or see. That is why you can't know God unless God knows you. That is why you can't apprehend God unless you are apprehended by God. Because you can't look and say, you know what, water, eyes, and steam, I get it, I know God. No, you don't know God. That's not God. Because no one knows the Father but the Son. No one knows the Son but the Father. And if you're going to know God, you're going to know it because Jesus shows you. Blessed are you, Simon. Her flesh and blood didn't show you this. This is similar to what Jesus says in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Pastor, I want to get to heaven. I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow the principles of Eastern mysticism. You won't get there. Pastor, I believe in God and I just sort of follow my own compass of my inner heart. Well, the Bible says your heart is deceitful and wicked. You're not going to get there. You might say, Pastor, I'm going to follow the, uh, the teachings of Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Mormon church, you're not going to make it. Oh, you might say, now, Pastor, I'm going to follow the teachings of Muhammad outlaid in, in the Quran. You're not going to make it. Because Jesus says the only way to the Father is through me, and without me, you won't know the Father. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. You might say, Pastor, is it really that exclusive? You're telling me that in all the 7 billion people on planet Earth, that only those who believe in Jesus truly belong to God? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Amen. That is exactly what I'm telling you. And I'm not telling you that. God is telling you that. Jesus Christ is saying that. You might say, well, I think Jesus was just a good man. Let me tell you what good men don't do. They don't say, I'm equal to God. You might say, well, I think Jesus was a good prophet. Let me tell you what good prophets don't do. They don't say, I'm the only way to God. Unless, in fact, they truly are. You see, if Jesus is not the Son of God, then He wasn't a good man. Because He blasphemed. He said He was equal with God. He said He's going to come back at the end of the age and He's going to burn up the people that don't believe in Him. He says that he was the fulfillment of prophecy. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Good men don't come and make claims like that. But God does. And if you're going to know God, you're going to know Him as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why John says in 1 John 2, 23, No one who denies the Son has the Father. Catch that. No one who denies the Son has the Father. But whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Now, this passage, this whole chapter has been very pessimistic. Here comes the divine Son incarnate to planet Earth, and He is healing and He's doing miracles. And then He opens His mouth and says, but I want you to listen to my claims and follow me and repent and believe. And they say, no, we're not going to do it. And then Jesus even says, but you know what? We've got some here who do believe because God the Father has taken the initiative in showing them the truth. We've got some here who do confess the Father because I've shown the Father to them. You might say, now, Pastor, that sounds very exclusive. It sounds like 
Other things I've read in the Bible that speak of the doctrine of election, well, it should because that's biblical. At the heart of the doctrine of election is this great truth that you don't just belong to God now, you have always belonged to Him. But Jesus isn't finished. No one knows spiritual truth without revelation. No one knows God without revelation. But I want you to hear this great invitation. All who come to Jesus will be received and find their rest in Him. He says, come to me. That's for you. That's for me. That's for everyone in this room. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a promise. And Jesus doesn't break promises. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That is a promise. And Jesus doesn't break his promises. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has been talking about all this unbelief. He's been talking about this exclusivity that you can't know God unless it's revealed to you. And then he throws the doors wide open. You see, Jesus didn't go through the cities. <clears throat> he didn't go through the cities doing his miracles here and there for a select few. He did his miracles for everyone to see. And even though people can't know God without it being revealed, even though people can't receive Jesus without it being revealed, at the same time, those who un do not believe make a complete, volitional, independent choice to reject. It's, it's amazing to think about. But if you reject Jesus, that's on you. But if you believe Jesus, that's on God. That's just the way that it is. If you reject Jesus, that's totally your doing. But if you believe in Jesus, that's God's doing. Because he revealed it to you. At the same time, Jesus says, come to me, all. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The labor and heavy laden kind of reminds us of the crowds that Jesus saw who were harassed and helpless in 936. Do you feel the weight of your sin? Are you burdened by your sin? Are you heavy laden by the burdens of life? Maybe the burdens of some false religion imposed on you that has burdened you down? Are you tired of those burdens? Do you long for rest? Well, let me tell you something. You will find it in Jesus. You will find it in Jesus. You will find in Jesus something you cannot find anywhere else. You will find a kind and compassionate Savior. You will find a loving Father. You will find atonement for your sin. You will find relief from your guilt. Understand something, folks. Sin comes with guilt and it comes with shame. That's just part and parcel of sin. We looked Wednesday night at Psalm 51 and David said, My sin is ever before me. But he said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You know how to get rid of guilt and sin? Come to Jesus. Because you're burdened, you're heavy laden. He will give you rest from it. He will give you rest. You just have to come. It's that simple. It's that simple. He says, take my yoke upon you <clears throat> and learn from me. Jesus has referred to the Pharisees and he said, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But he says of his own self, he says, my yoke is gentle. I am gentle and take my yoke on you. Jesus is saying, don't take on you the yoke of these false teachers. Now, what's a yoke? Some of you know what a yoke is. Many of you probably don't. A yoke, if you've ever seen like <clears throat> old images of a, maybe a horse-drawn uh, carriage or uh, uh, an ox cart, you know, the yoke is the, the mechanism that's laid on the neck of the animal that's pulling. So the idea is it's a burden. So if you want an ox to pull a cart, you put a yoke around his neck and you hitch your cart to it. And this, this oxen is pulling and the yoke is the means by which he is burdened down. There also were human yokes for like a, a human person to, to, to pull a load. He, he could have a cart and pull it. But the idea here is that a burden is being placed on you for the sake of productivity, for the sake of a goal, not just to have a burden, but you're doing something. And Jesus says, don't take on the yoke of the Pharisees or the yoke of the scribes or the yoke of false religion. Take on, take on my yoke. Take on 
Take on my burden. And he even says, but it's light. Uh, the word yoke had been used in Jewish culture to refer to the law, to refer to our responsibilities in the law. It had even been used in Jewish culture to refer to uh, wisdom. There's actually a Jewish text, it's not in the Bible, that uses language very similar to this. Uh, and, and it's talking about, a man's talking about being wise and learning wisdom. And said to put your neck under the yoke of wisdom and let your soul receive instruction. And if you labor under wisdom, you will find rest. Very similar to what Jesus said. The idea was that if you want a, a restful life, a good life free of burdens, then put your neck under the yoke of wisdom. Uh, it's kind of like this. Um, um, freedom comes on the other side of discipline. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you don't play the piano, but I said come up here and, and play a classical piece of music, you would not be free to do that, would you? <laughs> but if you'd spent years disciplining yourself, putting yourself under the yoke of tutelage and discipline, and learned those pieces, then you would be free to do that, wouldn't you? Do you see how freedom comes on the other side of discipline? So what we're being told in Jewish culture is put your neck under the yoke of the law and blessing will come to you. And we're told that wisdom, if you will put your neck under the yoke of wisdom, then blessing will come to you. And what we're being told about Jesus is that if you will lose your life, you'll find it. If you'll put your neck under my yoke, you'll find rest for your souls. You won't just find a better life. You won't just have talents and abilities you didn't have before. You're going to find eternal rest if you take on my yoke. Are you harassed and helpless? Are you burdened and heavy laden? If you'll come to me, I'll give you rest. What is this yoke? Well, it looks suspiciously like a Roman cross. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. When Jesus is promising to give rest, though, there's something else going on here. This is a highly Trinitarian passage. We've already seen that the Father and the Son are co-equal, exclusive. But there's something else that we see. When Jesus says, I will give rest, that's actually hearkening back to the Old Testament. A great theme of the Old Testament is God giving His people rest. As the Israelites left Egypt and they went through the wilderness, by the way, what happened to them in Egypt? They were burdened, they were heavy laden, they were enslaved. God called them out of Egypt, and he says, I will lead you into my rest. God continually referred to the promised land as the land of rest. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to fulfill those promises that God made. I'm going to give you rest. Jeremiah 6, 16 very well may be a parallel passage to this, where Jeremiah says, thus says the Lord, and he says, the Lord says this, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Very similar. But they said, we will not walk in it. So Jeremiah says the free offer is to people to come and find rest by walking in the Lord's way. But people are responding and saying, we're not going to walk in it. Jesus says, come to me. If you walk away from that offer, that's all on you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's gospel freedom. It doesn't mean that there's not any struggle at all. Jesus says the way to life is hard. But it means that it's a struggle that you can win. You'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit and you'll be promised rest. 1 John 5, 3, John tells us this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. So, what do we do with all this? You might say, well... Jesus says that only, only those who the Father reveals Himself to can know these things. So let's find out who those people are and go after them. No, that's not what we do. You see, we extend the call. We do the proclaiming. We do the inviting. God does the saving. And that's a pretty good deal. Because that means that every time you share the gospel, you have a 100% success rate. Because you've done your part. It's not up to you to save people. It's up to God to save people. It's also up to them to come. You see, we all play a part, don't we? <laughs> we share, God saves, they come. God's faithful to do His part. Are we faithful to do our part? Or are they faithful to do their part? So what do we do? We proclaim the gospel. We stand alongside Jesus as those who've taken His yoke. And we say, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And you know what's going to happen? 
those who are sick. Not those who are well, those who are sick. They'll come to the physician. You know what else will happen? The little children will come to Jesus. The wise and the prudent won't come. You know what else will happen? As Jesus says, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and the Gentiles, well, they'll, they'll enter right into the kingdom of God, but the children of the kingdom, they'll be cast out. You know what else will happen? The good soil, remember the parable of the soils? The good soil, it'll sprout forth fruit, and it'll bring forth 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. But the stony ground, the, the ground that has the thorns, the, the ground on the wayside, they won't sprout any fruit. You know what else will happen? The last will be first, the first will be last. You see, what's going to happen is, as the gospel's preached, the foolish will shame the wise, the weak will shame the strong, and the things that are not will bring nothing to things that are. And every single person, without exception, who comes to Jesus will be received. Every single one. For Jesus says, those who come to me I will never, ever cast out. You see, you might say, well, no, pastor, so you're saying that Jesus only came to save those who are foolish and those who are weak? No, no, no. You see, even the mighty can be saved, but they must become weak. Well, even the wise can be saved, but they must realize that their wisdom is foolishness before God. Now, what do we do? If you're here and you don't know Jesus, you don't need to reject Jesus. The message about Jesus but you need to believe it you need to answer Jesus invitation it's a free invitation and it's to every one of us to come to him to take his yoke and to learn from him and by that invitation we enter into a relationship an eternal fellowship with the father and the son a great man in the history of the church Saint Augustine he wrote his confessions telling his story of his conversion and in the first chapter he tells us this quote describing himself how he came to the Lord and he says God you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee if you're restless if you're laboring if you're heavy laden if you'll come to Jesus you will find rest let's pray father we thank you we thank you for your word we thank you that it's true father i thank you that you have saved me and you've called me with a holy calling but father i pray that you will save more father i pray that jesus will be revealed to even more i pray that others will see jesus for who he is trust in him follow him take on his yoke and find their rest Lord, today I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, today would be the day that they would come find rest. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.